This week on the other side, are we on the brink of World War III? Australia's longest serving Minister of Foreign Affairs says the impossible scenario has at least become a possibility. NRL star Jared Hayne has his rape conviction overturned, but technically could face a fourth trial on the same crime. Do we need to fix our criminal justice system? We'll discuss. Europe shifts to the right big time, leaving the elites reeling and France's president leaping to an election. We'll explain what all that means for Australia and why the Liberal and National parties need to pay attention. And Kevin Spacey speaks. The leading actor has never been convicted of any crime, but his career is in tatters and his fortune lost. G'day Adelaide, g'day Darwin, and g'day Australia. This is episode 317 of The Other Side for the weekend commencing Friday, June 14, 2024. I'm Damien Curry. And this is the show that brings you a summary of the best bits of news and commentary of the week that was through a small government, classical liberal, centre-right view of the world. And we're totally open and transparent about our perspective on things, unlike news organisations that pretend to be neutral when they are anything but. We have opinions, but we tell you where they're coming from, so you don't mistake our opinions for the absolute truth. And there is something wrong if you're agreeing with everything that you hear on this show. This show is for smart people who like to have their views challenged, not just reinforced. But you should agree with most of it. We try to get things right, but like everyone, our opinions and those of other people we share with you on the show can sometimes be wrong. We just want to make sure that Aussies have the chance to hear a range of different voices, not just the ones approved of by the mainstream media. And that's why this show exists and why we call it The Other Side. For a long time on this show, we've spoken about how the Western world, particularly the English-speaking Western world, has fallen into a kind of cultural self-indulgence, a state in which we take our peace for granted and our liberties for granted a state in which we've been hypercritical of ourselves to a damaging degree, in some kind of over-the-top virtue signalling self-flagellation that focuses on the sins of our history rather than all the good that we've brought to the world in the past and the present. We've been feeling as though we owe a debt to the other cultures of the world. It's kind of patronising, really, us assuming that they are not big and strong enough to take care of themselves, or worse, take care of us, in a not so friendly way, we become very, very cocky in a roundabout kind of fashion. We think we have no enemies that want to attack us, that we are the all powerful evil colonizers, so we couldn't possibly be attacked. It's an insane narrative built on identity politics and neo Marxist, new Marxism sort of nonsense. Our enemies are actually laughing at our stupidity and our self destruction. But they shouldn't make the big mistake of thinking that this glitch in our culture has fundamentally changed most of us or made us any less likely to firmly defend ourselves against any possible attack. The two big threats to the liberal democratic Judeo-Christian Western world order have always been communism and Islamic extremism. We'd always been united in our awareness of those threats and we understood them. But 30 years or so ago, all that started to change a bit once the Berlin Wall fell in 1989 and the Cold War came to an end as we once knew it, the United States became the dominant superpower in the world and we got a little too comfortable as one of their main allies. Fears of a rise of Islamism or communism kind of abated. Russia was no longer a threat, China was opening up and becoming our friend in business at least, and the Arab world was changing. We developed an almost naive perspective that in this new world order, everyone would be friendly and operate out of rational self-interest for mutual benefit in a liberal free trade oriented kind of benevolent utopia of globalization. Anyone who suggested that Islamism might pose a threat to the West and its Judeo-Christian ethos was labeled an Islamophobic racist. Anyone who suggested China would seek to become expansionist or revert to the highly oppressive authoritarian style communism of the Mao era was mocked and laughed at as being hysterical racists worried about reds under the bed, you crazy cookers. 
This was one of the failings of the way that Barack Obama engaged with China and the Pacific during his two terms as US president. He assumed everyone in the world thought just like we did. The mistake of thinking that our Western values just fell out of the sky and were universally shared by all. That China would never become a hostile threat, never clamp down on Hong Kong and its freedoms, never really seek to take Taiwan seriously. And yet here we are, on the brink of war with Russia, Iran and China, all at once. And that's the problem. Australia's longest serving foreign affairs minister and former High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, Alexander Downer, has issued a stark warning about one possible scenario that could unfold if all three of those potential conflicts did erupt at the same time. He's told former Deputy Prime Minister John Anderson on his podcast channel this week that it's not unrealistic to think that we really could be on the brink of a third world war. Now, while he's quick to stress that it's just one scenario and maybe not the most probable one, it is a possible scenario in the way that it hasn't been possible for decades. In some respects, I think it is the most dangerous time since the 1930s. Uh, if you like, I think there is a risk of world war, the like of which there hasn't been since the end of the Second World War. Mr Downer told John Anderson that the way a world war could develop is that with the Ukrainian war continuing, the Middle East Palestinian resistance to Israel and the China-Taiwan issue all happening at once, a catastrophic scenario could emerge like this. So the Middle East could spread. Iran could decide to unleash Hezbollah um, and um, uh, to the north of Israel and unleash um, Palestinian resistance on the West Bank, coupled with their continuing support for Hamas, leading to an American intervention as Israel's situation became increasingly desperate um, and the Chinese taking advantage of that. Because um, one of the things you, you the, the media don't cover this very often, but you have to realise the Chinese, the Russians and the Iranians are all talking to each other the whole time. I'm sorry, what? The Chinese, the Russians and the Iranians are all talking to each other the whole time? They're in constant contact. They know exactly what each other are doing. Um, and they do work together in a kind of loose alliance. And if they unleash this loose alliance against the West, then and that could happen that could happen through accident, if you like, through miscalculation. Um, they could the Iranians could overreach in their support for Hezbollah um, and the other groups that they do support, like the Houthis, they could overreach. Um, that could lead to the Americans having to become involved. Um, and at the same time, the Chinese could opportunistically see this as a way of introducing, perhaps to start with, a modest blockade of Taiwan as America is distracted in the Middle East and in Ukraine. And um, in those circumstances, the Americans would have to do something about the blockade of Taiwan as well. Mr Downer was at pains to stress that this is not necessarily what will happen, but there, that it is a scenario where it could. So how do we resist all of this? Well, not by being in any way woke or timid in our resolve to protect our own societies and way of life, but by sending firm signals to the Russians and the Chinese and Iran that the West is just as determined to defend itself now as at any other time in history. And the way to resist that is to make it perfectly clear, the West to make it perfectly clear that um, we will be ruthless in prosecuting our interests, not that we will be half-hearted or uncertain, which is what we've been over the last 20 years. Ruthless. Peace through strength. It's the only language that communists and jihadists understand. As Jordan Peterson says, the good man is one who is capable of exacting great and powerful damage upon evil, but who never acts on that unnecessarily. President Xi and Putin and Iran's Ayatollah would perhaps be wise to not assume the West's liberalism and softness and temporary insanity at the moment with all this woke nonsense means that we in any way have become less likely to resist their tyranny 
any less ruthlessly than before. Hey, just a reminder that The Other Side is available to watch every Friday night from 8 p.m. on ADH TV and YouTube. If you'd like to support us, the best way is to subscribe on our channel on YouTube. It's absolutely free. Just hit that subscribe button and the little bell too. That will notify you when we post anything. Also, if you're feeling generous, feel free to send us a super thanks donation on YouTube. You can do that by clicking the new little dollar sign thanks icon. You can see that little button under the video frame on YouTube. And you can also follow us on X, Twitter, at Other Side Oz. That's A-U-S. Every little bit helps. One of the things that concerns me about bureaucrats and is why I'm so passionate about keeping government small and keeping our national wealth in the hands of the people in the private economy and free enterprise is that government corrupts people because of the lack of daily accountability. If you're in business, you're accountable to the customers and clients and shareholders and staff every single day. And that makes leaders humble over time. Most people who run businesses know their limits and have copped knocks and have been forced to grow up. People in top leadership in government roles are a little bit different, generally. They have learned not to be accountable to the marketplace, but to be accountable to each other. You get to the top in government by sucking up and saying the right things to the right people. Now, I'm oversimplifying hugely here, I know. I'm not saying that there's zero accountability in government, nor am I saying that there's zero sucking up or corruption or nepotism or politics inside private businesses, especially big corporations. I'm just saying that the rewards tend to be more one way or the other. The jerk manager that you've got to work with in a private business, he's going to screw up and get it fired long before his government equivalent is going to screw up and get fired. But of course, big corporations can be as bad as government and get just as detached from market demands and day-to-day competition. But bureaucrats seem to develop a sense of entitlement and self-righteousness that those accountable to the marketplace in small and medium enterprise at least just can't afford to develop. If you do, you go out of business. And what got me thinking about this was that when I was putting last week's show together, I noticed a similarity that actually some of you have picked up in the comments this week between the attitudes of Australia's e-safety commission and its head, Julie Inman Grant, and the former US medical chief of the NIH, Dr. Anthony Fauci. A lack of humility in the way that they seem to go about their roles an overconfidence and hubris in their own self-correctness, a dangerous unwillingness to consider the implications and the side effects of what they're doing, a single-minded self-righteousness to barge ahead without adequate reflection and humility. We saw it in Dan Andrews. He even got rewarded with a king's honor this week for his COVID mismanagement. It is astounding stuff. But what was really telling last week was the fact that Both of these people, I mean, Julie Inman Grant and Anthony Fauci, who in my humble personal opinion, it's just a personal opinion, I'm sure Julie is exceptional at her job in in many ways, uh, and she's a high achieving woman, um, but does seem to lack some humility in the way that, that she's performing this role. And in my humble personal opinion, they do tend to become kind of bureaucratic bullies in the way that they conduct themselves and do their public jobs. Both of them, like this particular personality type often does, played the victim card in public appearances last week. Now, Elon Musk, you will have noticed, took to his platform at one stage in the last month or so. He described you in somewhat personal terms, I suppose, Australia's censorship commissar. How did that weigh with you? Um, Well, he issued a dog whistle to 181 million users around the globe, which resulted in death threats uh, directed at me, which resulted in doxing of my family members, including my three children. Um, So I think with great power comes great responsibility and exercising that restraint in terms of targeting a a regulator who is here to protect the citizens of Australia um, is really beyond the pale. Yes, I'm the victim here. It's not the fact that I'm metaphorically beating you over the head with a brick. It's that you're bleeding all over over my nice pretty dress and you're defending yourself. How dare you from my $750,000 a day fines. That's very rude, Elon. And drawing attention to me in a way that's making people say mean things about me. The e-safety commissioner is the one with the power here, folks. She has the power to impose massive fines and ultimately jail 
And now she wants even more power to actively disrupt businesses that don't comply. They want to go in and prevent social media companies from taking any advertising money. It's unbelievable. And I also love this term. You hear it all the time now. Oh, it was a dog whistle. It was a dog whistle, right? I think the dogs just want to be left out of it. Thank you very much. Um, but that term dog whistle, it's meant to imply that, you know, a signal's being sent to some sort of evil, bad deplorables in the, in the Hillary Clinton sense of deplorables, uh, you know, to come and get, come and get you. Go, go get, go get them. It's a dog whistle. No, please. I mean, you are no victim, Julie. You are in this case, the perpetrator. You just don't like the fact that Elon is big enough and rich enough and a bit crazy enough to actually stand up to you where other big te tech companies would just be like, eh, it's only Australia, who cares? You know, small market, couldn't be bothered because he actually cares about free speech a bit. We got a similar attempt to play victim this week from Anthony Fauci during the US congressional hearings. Independent media commentators Dave Rubin and Megan Kelly got together to discuss this one on Megan's video show. So Dr. Fauci, can you please share with us the nature of the threats you have received since the car <laughs> start of the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, yes, there have been um, everything from harassments by emails, texts, letters uh, of myself, my wife, my three daughters. Uh, there have been credible death threats leading to the arrests of two individuals. And credible death threats mean someone who clearly was on their way to kill me. Um, and it's required my having... Uh, protective services uh, essentially all the time. Uh, it is very troublesome to me. Um, it is much more troublesome because they've involved my wife and my three daughters. At these moments, how do you feel? Oh my Lord. <laughs> Keep your mic on. Terrible. Do you continue to receive threats today? Yes, I do. Every time someone gets up and says I'm responsible for the death of people throughout the world, the death threats go up. Well, you are. He is. No My. one feels sorry for you. No one. Can you believe that? Megan, have you ever received a, a mean email or, uh, or a mean text? I'm, I'm gonna, you want to see my death threats? <laughs> Let's go over the past 10 years. Yeah, exactly. Now, death threats are terrible. They are illegal, by the way. And if you make them, you will be prosecuted because even anonymous social media accounts can be tracked after a death threat. So don't do that, that's bad. And we should be able to sort out our differences peacefully. The problem with people like these leaders is that they just never show humility. They act with absolute authoritarian style and then defend themselves to the death even after being proven wrong. He, in all the Fauci sots, uh, sound bites I've seen, I have yet to see him shed a tear. Yeah, for right, the isn't that dead, something? For the children who suffered because of his unsupported mandates over and over issued with hubris and no empathy for the people who are gonna be affected, the children who are gonna be affected in particular, the people who lost their jobs because of the vaccine mandates that he was behind. Not one even quivering lip. It only happens when it's about him. It's so, it's so twisted. The people that didn't get to go to their mother or grandmother's funeral. Right. Like think, just think of that. We watch all... their spouses die through a window. I heard yet another story this week about a young teenager battling serious anxiety disorder and the hell her parents are going through all because of lockdowns. We may be the first generation in history who sacrificed its young to save its elderly. That's not a sustainable strategy for a species. And think about the hubris of Dan Andrews and the brutality that he was prepared to unleash on Melbourne. And think about the pure arrogance of Anastasia Palaszczuk and Mark McGowan with their closed borders and denying people the harmless right to see dying loved ones, while at the same time letting footballers travel freely for games. All they had to do was show some damn humility and humanity. The public were very willing to afford them a lot of support and cut them a lot of slack in the difficult job that they had before them and had to handle. But you have to show you're listening and be a little bit reasonable. Tyrannical authoritarian personality types are attracted to leadership roles and to politics. And in many corporations, they're on the lookout for these people and they're weeding them out or getting them training 
They're not giving them medals of the Order of Australia for their appalling lack of leadership, maturity and talent. Just a warning that this next story is not appropriate for kids, so if you have little ones around, it uh, might be best right now to uh, switch off and return later. This happened on Wednesday. Good afternoon. We're bringing you breaking news. Jared Hayne has just walked free after winning an appeal to have his conviction overturned for raping a woman in Newcastle in 2018. These pictures just into the newsroom showing the former NRL star leaving the correctional facility in Lidcombe where he'd been serving a term of four years and nine months for sexually assaulting a woman. Those convictions were quashed when he won the appeal this morning. Now he's been granted bail. That's how Seven News reported the latest chapter in the six-year saga of football star Jared Haynes' experience with the New South Wales criminal justice system. On September 30, 2018, the NRL superstar paid $550 for a cab after a Bucks weekend to take him to a woman's house in Newcastle. He'd been texting with this woman on Instagram for a fortnight before he decided to go to her house. He was only there for 46 minutes. It was their first meeting, but he allegedly left her with injuries to her genitals after having digital and oral sex with her in her bedroom. There was blood on her bedspread. In his trial, the court heard Hayne forcibly kiss the woman, pushed her head into a pillow, then pulled off her jeans before sexually assaulting her, despite the woman saying no and stop. But like so many sexual assault cases, it's a he said, she said because nobody else was in the room, of course. And Mr. Haynes' version is that the woman kissed him back and stood up before taking off her own pants. He was arrested two months later in November 2018. It took two years to go to trial. We don't do timely justice in this country anymore. We make innocent people suffer and sweat, and the legal elites don't seem to care too much about that anymore. They just, it's not too bad. And in December 2020, the first trial ended in a hung jury after two days of deliberation. Three months later, trial number two happens and Hayne is found guilty of two counts of sexual intercourse without consent. Now, sexual intercourse is defined as that digital and oral intercourse that we were talking about earlier, okay? Uh, so he was found guilty of, of two counts of sexual intercourse without consent. He was found not guilty of the original charges of aggravated sexual assault and inflicting actual bodily harm. Now, a full year later, in April 2022, he wins his first appeal against the convictions in the second trial. But the New South Wales Court of Criminal Appeal ordered another retrial, and they let him out on bail in the interim. Then another full year later, in May last year, 2023, he was convicted for the second time. The conviction this time was for digital and oral sexual assault, and he cops four years and nine months jail. He appeals again, as you would. This takes almost another full year to be heard. And this second appeal was on three points. That the original verdicts weren't supported by evidence at the trial and were therefore unreasonable. That the trial judge was wrong in not making the accuser give evidence about another interaction that she had with a man that she messaged the same day as the alleged Hain attack. And three, that the trial judge, Graham Turnbull's ruling, resulted in a miscarriage of justice. The appeals court upheld number two and number three, but not number one. Now, let's just get clear on what those text messages that the woman didn't have to give evidence about actually were. Haynes' lawyer, Tim Game, said that these messages were deleted by the woman from her phone and showed that the woman was consenting to the sex that she had with Hain. Mr. Games said a miscarriage of justice had occurred when district court, uh, district court ruled that the defence could not cross-examine the witness on those deleted or undisclosed messages. On Wednesday, Hayne won that appeal and he was immediately released from jail. Here's how Channel 9 reported the news that day. The appeal centred around three grounds. One failed, but two were successful. They related to Judge Graham Turnbull's refusal to allow Haynes' lawyers to question the complainant about deleted messages on the day of and after the alleged assault. One of them read, if those messages get out, I'm and he will get off. So Mr Haynes' convictions have now been quashed. All good, mate. You're innocent. You can... Uh 
you can go home now. Oh, sorry that we, uh, you know, wrecked your life and caused you and your family untold agony for six years while we played legal theoretical chess, but uh, no hard feelings, hey? Oh, hang on a minute. That's not how our criminal justice system works. Oh, no, we're, we're crushing the conviction and ordering a retrial again. That'll be the fourth trial. The New South Wales Director of Public Prosecutions, the DPP, will decide whether or not there will be a fourth trial for the same alleged crime next month. One of the appeals court judges made it clear, though, that they did not think that putting Hayne on trial for a fourth time was in the interests of justice. But it's, of course, a decision for the DPP. Yes, yes. Well, you take your time, lawyer people. It's only the life of a man we're messing with here. Actually, we can't comment on that too much because uh, this specific case is technically still before the courts. But generally speaking, not related to this particular case, I'm just wondering, do we need to put some kind of limits on how many times a person can be tried over the same alleged crime? How many times in Australia do you need to be found not guilty of something before prosecutors are actually forced to stop prosecuting? Is there a point where prosecution becomes persecution? I've also noticed, generally speaking, that for most serious crimes in our country, the system seems to be a little too gentle on the accused and doesn't look after the victim so well. But when it's a sexual assault crime allegation involving a man accused of attacking a woman, oh, we seem to be very keen to brush over the old uh, presumption of innocence. Who cares about that? The man is supposed to be afforded the presumption of innocence, of course, but no. Now, I'm just making general observations here, of course. Um, returning, though, to the, uh, to the Hain case itself, it's interesting to note that he would have been eligible for parole next May anyway. And at the rate this thing is moving through our fantastically efficient and effective and healthy legal system, it'll all be redundant by the time it's sorted out. What's that old expression, justice delayed is justice denied? Yeah, that, that hasn't applied for a very long time at in good old Australia. It might be time to actually do something about that someday, legal eagles, don't you reckon? Or, or do men actually have to start marching in the streets like women have been doing for many years? You're watching The Other Side on ADH TV and YouTube, your weekly Aussie summary of all the best news and commentary of the week without the woke. And if you're watching us on YouTube, please do smash that subscribe button and make comments. It all helps us to keep doing what we're doing. Now, speaking of men who've had their careers ruined by a culture that hears the accusations but never pays much attention to the news of the acquittal, one of the greatest actors of our time and two-time Academy Award winner Kevin Spacey's career has never recovered from the things that he was accused of that he didn't do. I thought this stuff only happened to to straight white men, but apparently happens to gay white men too. He took time out to appear on Piers Morgan Uncensored this week for a lengthy interview that is a must watch. In 2017, actor Anthony Rapp alleged that Kevin Spacey made a sexual advance towards him at a party 30 years earlier, when Rapp was 14 years old and Spacey was 26. He sued Spacey in 2020 for sexual assault and battery Spacey was found not guilty and not liable on all counts. Now that we were able to prove in a federal court in 2022 mm -hmm. that the accusation that Anthony Rapp had never happened did not occur, that people will understand that I was coming from a place where in my heart of hearts, I didn't believe it had happened. I was a little bit pushed into the corner because when someone says, uh, I mean, I don't know how you might react, Paris, but if someone says, you know, you did this thing to me 34 what? years ago what? and you were so drunk you won't remember, mm -hmm. my first initial response wasn't to call him a liar. My first response was to ask myself, did I, did mm -hmm. I do something embarrassing? No. He did say he thought I was trying to get with him sexually, but he did not in any way make any sexual assault allegation mm. against me. He didn't do that until he filed a civil And lawsuit. he filed a $40 million lawsuit in a yes. Manhattan federal court. But the jury took little over an hour to come back and find you not guilty. $40 million. That's US dollars. So that's 60 million Australian dollars. It used to be 40 million Australian dollars, but that's another story. 
Forty million dollars. I mean, there's no motive to go there on a witch hunt, is there? Right? No, no motive to make anything up. Kevin Spacey's lawyer, in closing arguments, said that Rapp had made up the encounter, and then he suggested some reasons why. Maybe possible, she said, that Rapp invented it based on his experience performing in Precious Sons, a play in which actor Ed Harris picks up Rapp's character and lays on top of him, mistaking him briefly for his wife before discovering it's his son. Wow. OK. Yeah, no chance of a mistaken memory thing going on there. 30 years, uh, never mind. Spacey told Morgan that he descended into a very dark place after the accusations, as you would, and also after the trial. But funnily enough, it's all made him a better person. You know, I look back at times when I, I think, wow, I, I wasn't as kind as I could have been. I wasn't as generous as I could have been. I wasn't as prepared as I could have been. You know, I, I, I look back now at, 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 I was so focused and determined on what happened on stage and in front of a screen that I missed a lot of things that were happening off screen and off stage. And now I'm enormously grateful that my focus has shifted. My goal is no longer to be the best actor, which it was. My goal is now to prove that I'm a man of good character. In May 2022, Spacey was charged in the UK with four counts of sexual assault against three complainants in London and Gloucestershire between 2005 and 2013. He voluntarily, he didn't have to, he voluntarily returned to the UK to face those charges and he pleaded not guilty. Spacey faced a total of 12 charges, three were dismissed at trial and then he was found not guilty of the other nine in July last year. But his career was over. He was cancelled. But he says, we've seen this kind of witch hunt mob rule pitchfork behaviour in our society before. There were more than 479 people whose lives were largely destroyed by being accused of being communists. Mm. And the media was a partner in that. I mean, you go and, you know, you, there's an incredible book about Charlie Chaplin called Charlie Chaplin versus the United States yeah. of America. Yeah. And it is extraordinary mm. the number of columnists who were talking to the FBI, talking mm. to Hoover, and then writing stories about people who, I mean, Lee Grant couldn't get a job for 12 years because she wouldn't testify against her husband uh, in front of the House uh, on Activities Committee on American. And so we've seen this before, and I think that I'm not an expert in this, but what I've observed is that there is a lot of fear. People are afraid for their own careers and their own positions if they stand in solidarity with somebody who has been found not guilty. And I hope that as time goes on, that that will begin to shift in the right direction. Now, a lot of people um, have said that Kevin Spacey was, you know, accused of many, many other things. It's kind of good in a way not to be a powerful, super filthy rich person, because <laughs> if you are uh, and, and this sort of stuff starts rolling, then lots of people come out of the woodwork. And there were heaps of crazy allegations like this one, as an example, one of them came from a Hollywood masseuse a guy, a masseuse who claimed that Spacey had groped him. We had irrefutable evidence to show that I wasn't even in the state of California when he made this accusation. Uh, had, had occurred. Um, and, and we were very confident that we were going to be able to present, as we have in other cases, um, that evidence. Uh, I also would simply say this was a man who was over 60 years old. And so there's lots of stories about me, you know, in, enjoying the company of younger men. So this was the first time I was accused of abusing a senior citizen. Um, and, you know, we found out from his family that he had cancer prior to filing that a civil suit, and he died of cancer. And, you know, it was sad, um, but we never had the opportunity to go in front of uh, uh, the court and to prove our innocence. There have been a couple of other uh, stories mm -hmm. about alleged accusers who also passed away, right. which are entirely not true. In the first place, one of those people was not an accuser. She was a stalker, and in fact, stalked me for many years, sent 
white powder in the mail to the Old Vic Theater, called in bomb threats to the Old Vic Theater. We had to evacuate the theater on a number of occasions and threatened my life. And she was arrested, charged and convicted in a court in the United States and served more than four years in prison. Unbelievable. A high profile person who's rich or is, you know, powerful in politics or something is a very attractive target to those who might like to use false accusations to get rich quick. Piers Morgan asked Spacey how he felt going through the trial ordeals. The, the day it happens, I mean, the, the actual day mm -hmm. where they're gonna, they're gonna come in and tell you what the verdicts are. Yeah, yeah you're, you're definitely, I was definitely like, you know, what if this doesn't go the way I hope? Um, but as each count was read, and as each time the juror said, not guilty, I knew that we had presented the right case, and I knew that we had the evidence to prove I was not guilty of those things that I was accused of. Elton John and his husband, David Furnish, both gave witness statements, Elton by video, from his, his home in uh, the south of France. What did that mean to you, to have people of his stature step up for you? You actually just reminded me that uh, Elton was the first email I got on October 30th of 2017, after the rap story had come out, saying, we love you, whatever you need, we're here for you. And Elton has been there and David have been there ever since. What's most interesting about the fact that they testified in the trial in the UK was that I didn't ask them. I told them a piece of information that one of the accusers had said about them, which was not true. Mm. And Elton and David said, well, we have to testify. And I was like, well, are you kidding? No, we absolutely have to testify. We have to let the jury know that this individual is not telling the truth. And they insisted on it that's the kind of friends that I have, um, that I've been very fortunate to have in my life. Now, Kevin Spacey is clearly a highly sexual person and he lived his life as a closeted bisexual man who regularly hit on people. He admits he was wild, hypersexual and flirtatious. That was all the rage and very cool in the 70s and 80s. But in the post Me Too era of sexual prudism imposed only on men, I might point out, it seems that straight or gay, overt expression of male sexuality is to be condemned. Spacey admits though that he was a bit too handsy with people. I've tried in the workspace to not cross the line because it's always risky if you find yourself attracted to somebody you're working with. And but what your critics would say is uh, well, maybe not, but you're Kevin Spacey. And if you're an 18, 19, 20 year old young male actor and Kevin Spacey is fluttering his drunken eyelashes at you, <laughs> you know, for want of a better phrase. Yeah, that was, that was very nice. I like that. Um, the, 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 in a way that in itself can constitute an, an abuse of power. Do you accept that? I, I, I can understand that perspective. I, I, I truly can. But at the same time, I'm a human being, mm. and if I fall in love with somebody across a room, then am I not supposed to go and have a conversation with them or see if they're interested because I'm famous? Mm. Because that, I mean, you know, look, there are, I'm sure you have heard countless stories about relationships that began with one of the parties being more aggressive than the other. Well, 40% of all marriages historically began in the workplace. Historically, with a, an older man in a superior position to a slightly younger woman. That was just the nature of, of the workplace. Now it's very difficult to see how those numbers could possibly be happening because people are pretty much not allowed to have any workplace relationships. So it's, it's been a massive societal change, which many think has gone too far. Spacey has certainly paid for his behaviour, even though nothing criminal ever happened. In 2020, he was ordered to pay $31 million to the studio that produced the show House of Cards for violating its sexual harassment policy. He appealed, but the request was denied. He talked about his current financial troubles with Piers Morgan in the interview, 
but I won't be a spoiler. Go check it out. It's 90 minutes, this interview. It's well worth watching. It's on Piers Morgan Uncensored, and it will certainly make you think. There is a huge shift going on in Europe, which if you only looked at the mother country, Britain, you would think wasn't happening at all. On the continent, things are very different to in the UK, or at least it seems. Conservative and small government free market politicians are on the rise as people are waking up to the reality of the dangers of excessive socialist politics of the radical left. The anti-authoritarian forces remain strong. People don't like authoritarians, whether they're on the left or the right. They want their freedoms, thanks. But they also want to keep their distinct cultures and a bit of class. Not everyone wants to be part of a big European soup. And there's strong annoyance with the large levels of immigration from outside the EU that was allowed by left-leaning governments over the past couple of decades inside the EU. It seems reality is slamming virtue signalling right in the face. So how do we know about this shift? Well, Europe has had its elections for the rather weird 720-seat European Parliament in the past week or so. It's not something too many people in Europe take too seriously, except that it's often a pretty good indicator of things to come in the real government elections inside Europe's individual countries. So it's like a big poll. And boy, was there a swing to the right. It wasn't as big as expected, and it was mainly confined to France and Germany, but they are the two biggies. Now, if you're not a numbers nerd, I just need you to bear with us for 60 seconds. This will only take a few seconds, but here are the results. Okay, this analysis comes from the excellent YouTube channel TLDR News. They're going to show us what the European Parliament looked like before the election and what it's going to look like now that the elections happened. The party groupings that you'll see in this video uh, that I'm about to show you, they go from left to right politically, from the left to the right of your screen. So the reds are on the left, the blues are on the right, more or less. Over to TLDR. Anyway, going into the election, the composition of the European Parliament was as follows. The EPP had 176 MEPs, the Socialists and Democrats had 139, Renew had 102, the Greens had 71, the ECR had 69, Identity and Democracy had 49, the Left had 37, and the remaining 62 MEPs were what's known as non-inscripts, i.e. without a group. According to current projections, as of Monday morning, after this weekend's elections, this is how things have changed. The EPP won eight more seats, taking their total to 184. The Socialists and Democrats have maintained the same number of MEPs, with 139. Renew have lost 22 MEPs, taking their total to 80. The ECR won four more seats, taking their total to 73. Identity and Democracy won nine more seats, taking their total to 58. The Greens lost 19 seats, taking their total to 52. The Left lost one seat, taking their total to 36 and the number of non-inscript MEPs rose by 36, for a total of 98. Now, some of the numbers didn't quite match the graphics there, you might have noticed, because they updated that video uh, and the numbers were still coming in. But that's roughly what happened. So TLDR says the shift to the right is clear and undeniable. Every group to the right of Renew won seats, while every group to the left of, and including Renew, saw their share of MEPs decrease with an especially sharp drop for both Renew and the Greens. It's also worth noting that the non-inscript group mostly included parties on the European right, like Germany's AFD, Hungary's Fidesz and Poland's Confederation, who could plausibly join or cooperate with either Identity and Democracy or the ECR in the future, or even form their own new group. Yeah, so those groupings that you see there in the EU Parliament, they're made up of parties from inside European countries that are roughly similar across countries, right? They band together in the European Parliament and they vote in blocks. It'd be like the Australian Labor Party and the New Zealand Labor Party forming a group if we had some kind of Australasian Union Parliament, God forbid. Um, so when you break it all down into the individual country level, uh, you can then see the impacts. So if we just look at it country by country, uh, let's just take the German uh, parties voting, for example. In Germany, not only did the centre-right Christian Democrats come first with a massive 30% plurality, but despite a series of scandals, the far-right AFD also came second, beating Scholz's Social Democrats by a couple of percentage points. 
It was similar in France, which led to the week's other big news out of Europe, that the French president, Emmanuel Macron, has called an early election. He's not due to go to the polls until 2027, but he thinks going now will stop the far right from being able to organise properly and further build support. In France, Marine Le Pen's Rassemblement National won a 31% plurality, more than double that of Macron's Renaissance-led coalition, who only just beat the socialists. The appalling results provoked him into calling snap elections, essentially daring the French electorate to actually put Le Pen in power. So we'll see how that plays out. Now, votes for the Greens were absolutely slammed. They dropped 50% in both France and Germany. Hooray although they did slightly outperform poll expectations in the Scandinavian countries and Holland. But people are waking up to the watermelon lie of the Greens all over the world, it seems. The Greens are really very, very red on the inside. So I think two trends are at play here. People are sick of rising energy prices and they're worried about energy security. So they're tired of the climate change lobby pushing too fast to transition to renewables with too little hard science to support their carbon theory on global warming at this point. And the impact on farming and over-regulation of farmers has been a really big factor. The other trend is the pushback on the support immigration or you're racist ideology. People want to maintain the cultural integrity of their countries and they're concerned about the rising Islamification of Europe. These are the broad trends that Australia's centre-right and right parties should take from all of this. The left have infiltrated Australia's centre-right parties, the Liberals and the Nationals, in the past decade or two. They've been pushing the lie that if they pull back on their traditional policies and values and start to back more leftist, centre-left ideas on climate and gender and immigration, that they'll win. Well, that, that whole approach has worked really, really well for the Liberal and National parties not. It's led to a completely Labor Australia in every state and territory except Tasmania. And the wimpy Libs will not win the October election in Queensland so much as Labor will just lose it because they're so on the nose. So I reckon the Libs can only win with this small target strategy of playing centre-left politics and being just Labor light uh, in, in places where Labor are so on the nose that the people are ready to to hand over, and that's what's gonna happen in Queensland. What the Libs and Nats have to realise, though, I think, is that the mainstream is really shifting, and it's shifting fast. And if One Nation and the Libertarian Party can get their acts together and professionalise, which I don't really think they can, I'm sorry, uh, maybe, maybe, I don't know. Uh, or if another organisation emerges that's very professional, has no, you know, sort of branding issues from the past or anything, then the coalition is going to lose a significant slice of votes to that new emerging conservative force at the next federal poll. Now, OK, before you say Damo's just bashing the Liberal Party again, no, I actually want the Liberal Party to be successful. If, if you don't think what I am saying is possible if the coalition doesn't find its core values again, take a look at this. This is the UK. This is YouGov polling for the upcoming general election in the UK in three weeks. You see that dark blue line there that goes from around 50% in 2020 to just 18% this week? That is the UK Conservative Party support. The once great Tory party, demolished in the political equivalent of go woke, go broke. The red line is Labour, of course, but Take a look at the light blue line, or dare I say teal coloured line. Uh, no, that's a bad analogy. That's not what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make. The light blue line. It's almost touching that dark blue line now, right? That is the Reform Party, the very Conservative Party that Nigel Farage is now leading into the July 4 election. They are up on 17%. Here's another version of the same chart from UK Sky News that makes it all a bit clearer. Does this send the fear of God into you, traditional Liberal and National Party members? It should. The time to stop listening to the new lefties in your ranks would be right about now, before it's too late and you go the way of the Tories. The time to start welcoming back the Australian Conservatives and try to win back Conservative members would also be now, I think. But back to Europe. There's a lot that the European right-wing parties do not agree on. They don't agree on Russia versus Ukraine. 
European conservatives and reformists support Ukraine, while other groups tend to be pro-Russian. The conservative Prime Minister of Italy, Georgia Maloney, is building ties with French right-wing leader Marine Le Pen and the centre-right European Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen. Maloney supports Ukraine. On the other hand, conservative Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban is the closest EU ally of Russian President Vladimir Putin, and he has stopped a number of EU aid packages for Ukraine. So it's a bit messy on the right on that issue at the moment. All the centre-left and left-wing media are freaking out about the far right emerging. But they think anything right of Adam Bant in drag at a pride rally is far right. Although there does exist a nasty fascist authoritarian actual far right in Europe. And my message to the left would be this. Pull your heads in a bit and start embracing dialogue with the sensible centre-right. Compromise a little or else you'll see the actual racist weirdos on the real far right rise more and more. And that is good for nobody. We know what happened last time we saw that phenomenon in Europe. Let's make sure it's a steady pendulum swing back to the sensible centre right and not a snapping back of a rubber band that will sting you in the face, lefties. Actually, this was the point that the, uh, the comedy team at the US site Babylon B made recently. Uh, thank you all for meeting with me. You're all doing some wonderful work destroying the world, um, but I think it's probably time for us to um, reevaluate. Yes, yeah, sorry for the interruption, but I think we're in the wrong meeting. We're not here to destroy the world. We're here to save it. You see, we are some of the leading leaders of liberal causes, and I'm with the Human Rights Campaign, who focus on LGBTQ plus and trans rights. You see, I have the equal sign to let you know that I'm a good person. Ooh. Oh, excuse me, uh, women's reproductive rights, oh. climate, oh. Ah. free Palestine, uh, open borders. I misspoke before. You guys are not destroying the world, okay? You are saving the world. Hey, whoa, whoa, what's up with those scare quotes? Pretty sure I didn't use scare quotes when I said saving the world. Is again. The important thing to keep in mind is that there's a big election coming up and you and I, we're all on the same page, okay? So if we want Biden to win, he needs to win in order for us to save the world. If we want Biden to win, you folks, how can I say this? You, you, you might need to tone it down just- Tone down what? That's the Babylon B. Babylon B. Satan also had some advice for the pronoun crowd. Uh, you have been going over the top as well. Well, it's important for us, they, them, to be accepted just like everyone else. <laughs> yes, of course, of course, of course. And convincing people that they're intolerant for not wanting men to get naked in women's locker rooms. I guess that's genius. I mean, come on, it's next level stuff. All right, but insisting that your children be mutilated. I mean, come on, just turn people off, you guys. I mean, not everyone, obviously, but until, until the election, can we just all pretend for a few months not to be crazed, lunatic, Homicidal extremists? Extreme? No, it's my body. My Did you know that lots of Aussie YouTubers have to make American content to survive? We want to keep producing Aussie news, and to do that, we need your help. If you'd like to advertise on our show, please get in touch in the comments below, or DM us on Twitter, or drop us an email at info at othersideoz.com. Info at othersideoz.com. Our Australian content means we deliver a mostly Aussie audience. Or if you'd like to just help us with a donation, you can click on the super thanks button with the little dollar sign right under the video frame on YouTube. Or just click the subscribe button and bell. That helps heaps too, and it's free. And also, follow us on X. Thank you. The Spectator UK magazine's video show did a terrific interview with conservative best-selling author and commentator Douglas Murray this week, exploring how the new UK Labor government that they're almost certainly going to have soon will deal with the emerging leaders on the right in Europe, like Italy's Georgia Maloney, Holland's Geert Wilders and France's Marine Le Pen. All of those people were once described as right-wing extremists, now surprisingly in major leadership roles in their countries. Yet the Brits, like our government here in Australia, doesn't even like letting people who don't subscribe to modern woke ideology have a platform to speak. They'd rather we all just shut up and fade away so they can get on with wrecking the place. 
Douglas Murray recounted a recent trip to a Conservative conference in Europe that he took with a very Conservative UK Tory MP called Daniel Kaczynski. Even though Kaczynski is a member of the Conservative Party in the UK, there were calls from people, even within his own party, for him to have the whip withdrawn. And that's uh, posh UK speak for be kicked out of the party, more or less. Just for going to a Conservative conference in Europe. Sounds a lot like the Australian Liberal Party and its left-wing infiltration. Here's UK Spectator TV. Wednesday. Yes, uh, it was at a conference with, with uh, Daniel Kaczynski in Rome in 2020. And there were representatives of all the main conservative governments across Europe. Uh, Viktor Orban was there. Um, and uh, Georgia Maloney uh, was one of the speakers. And uh, Daniel Kaczynski, uh, Matteo Salvini was meant to be there, then didn't, didn't actually turn up in the end, but he was a much more prominent figure at the time, having been interior minister in Italy. Uh, Daniel Kaczynski was, was almost had the conservative whip withdrawn. Uh, certainly people like Margaret Hodge of the Labour Party called for him to have the whip withdrawn. Uh, members of his own party called for it because Daniel Kaczynski had appeared at a conference with these right wingers from the continent. And I remember saying the same thing then. What's going to happen when Georgia Maloney is Prime Minister? Well, we actually got the answer because three <laughs> years after the conference, Georgia Maloney is just around the corner from here on Downing Street, you know, kissing Rishi, Rishi Sunak and both of them talking about how wonderful the relationship is between Italy and the UK. Um, again, you could see this coming. Mm. Uh, but on that occasion, it was even faster. because That was just three years between you're not allowed in a room with this woman to... Prime Minister Maloney, how wonderful to see you. Yes, what a shift they make once the people have spoken and they realise how out of step they actually are. It's so, same with the uh, self-described right-wing liberal Geert Wilders from Holland. The results of the 2023 Dutch general election were described as one of the biggest political upsets in Dutch politics since World War II, with Wilders' party becoming the largest in the Dutch House of Representatives. Not big enough to govern on his own right or for Wilders to become Prime Minister, though. On the 13th of March, Wilders had to announce that he was not going to pursue his bid to become Prime Minister because potential coalition partners wouldn't support him. Although he did say that that was unfair and constitutionally wrong, just last month he announced he'd reached a provisional agreement with three other Dutch party leaders to form a coalition government. But he won't be the PM. Analysts say that Wilders generally considers himself to be a right-wing liberal. He says, quote, We will never join up with the fascists and Mussolinis of Italy. I'm very afraid of being linked with the wrong rightist fascist groups. He says former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher was his greatest political role model. Wilders is best known, though, for his anti-Islam views, and that's how he probably got his far-right label from the left. Not that it takes much to get one of those these days. Spectator TV and Douglas Murray recounted the time back in 2009 when Wilders was actually denied entry into the UK. Yes, I remember the affair very well. Get Wilders, uh, who was then a, already a member of the parliament in the Netherlands, uh, was meant to come to the UK. had been invited to give a speech at the House of Lords by a couple of peers, and he was turned away at the border. Um, and this was quite an insult. I mean, I don't think that people quite realised at the time uh, the Dutch ambassador turned up at the airport and uh, you know, it's a serious matter they regard as an insult. Uh, but he was turned away because the then Labour uh, Home Secretary, Jackie Smith, had decided that he should not be allowed to enter the country because his views on Islam could be uh, um, not conducive to the public good. Um, and I said at the time, as I mentioned in the piece, I said at the time to Jackie Smith and to the people who supported her move, what will you do when Wilders is prime minister? Mm. Now, Wilders is not quite prime minister, but he won, uh, uh, overwhelmingly won the number of seats at the Dutch elections last November. He's putting together a government. The main centre-right uh, party, the VVD, is, uh, is going in with him. And I just think it throws up as I say in my piece, a very interesting question, which is, in Britain, we have been very, very mis much misjudging what has been going on on the continent for a long time now. And one of the oddities is that the people who are, m present themselves as most Europhile mm -hmm. are the ones who've actually ignored the developments the most. Yeah, it's those who, who say that they want Britain back in the EU. 
who uh, hypocritically also want to ignore this political shift away from the new left that's going on in Europe, all around the world, as more uh, and more of the normal people rise up and reject the woke elites. That's Douglas Murray there speaking to UK Spectator TV's John Connolly. It's really time for us to put woke ideology to bed in Australia permanently. And for Australia's main centre-right parties, the Liberals and Nationals, to understand that the mainstream has shifted. Take the cue from the EU. Radical gender ideology, climate ideology, mass immigration and critical race theory are simply no longer and maybe never were mainstream. And that is all we have time for this week. On the other side, your weekly summary of the best news and commentary from around the internet. Please remember to follow us on Twitter X and YouTube at Other Side Oz. That's at Other Side AUS. They are our main two social media platforms. And please, please smash the subscribe buttons because that's the only way and the best way to support us and it's totally free. Smash every other button on the platforms that you possibly can and please make comments. All of those things help with those magical algorithms that we're all controlled by. And of course, you can also join us on ADH TV at ADH.TV on any web browser and it's totally free. And when you sign up on ADH, then you get all their other great content. Alexandra Marshall, Daisy Cousins, Spectator TV, Nick Cater, Church and State with Dave Pello, and all the special events that are up there for you to watch on demand also. We'll catch you next weekend for The Other Side. We drop a new show every Friday night at 8. And if you're watching on YouTube, please uh, click that bell and make sure you never miss any of our content by hitting the subscribe button and the little bell, and that'll notify you when we post new stuff, and it is absolutely free. Now, if you like what we're doing and you want to support us, uh, we haven't asked for money much in the past, but we do need it. Um, so do click that little dollar sign and make a super thanks donation so we can keep delivering for you. I'm Damien Curry. Bye for now. Have a great week.